been, <coughs> we've been focused on job creation. And uh, when we look at you know, job creation, ways to do job creation, clearly the entire spectrum of entrepreneurship then goes within the domain of that. And what I mean by that is that you know, everything from a new entrepreneur, an aspiring a new entrepreneur to an SME that's growing is in the stakeholder growth thing. And that's the entire life cycle. So for us, when we look at ecosystems, we understand that in the context of these stakeholder groups that we will be addressing. And uh, in our experience, you know, working over the past decade, is that when you talk of a national ecosystem, you know, a, any nation can look really robust, actually. And if you look at India today, you, know, you can see everybody from, you know, angel groups to VCs to experts, mentors, people from different, you know, uh, backgrounds, working with entrepreneurs, you have educators, you have trainers, you have consultants, you have a lot of people who are working with these entrepreneurs technically. Uh, but our experience is that, you know, ecosystems are a lot more, or need to be a lot more localized and city-centric even if you might, uh, in order for them to be really effective. Uh, it's extremely the number of times that I've heard investors actually you know, shy away from looking at the entrepreneur because the distance between where they reside and where the entrepreneur, you know, manages his or her company is so vast that it's practically really impossible to inter interact, engage in, uh, at the level at which they're comfortable working with each other. Uh, so, you know, so if I, if I were to then step back and say, what, what is it that we do? in the context of looking at ecosystems in this manner. For us, there are various pieces to an ecosystem when we look at even a city. And that includes, you know, because of, of, of the nature of our work, which is which starts with the uh, you know building the pipeline of new and future entrepreneurs, uh, the institutional network is a key part of an ecosystem. Uh, but apart from the institutional network, then the mentor network or the experts network is, is very important. Uh, so also at the next level, then the you know the small and grown business uh, network is, is important, and and also investor. And you know the way we we, we see these networks uh, you know function within an ecosystem is a great deal of of interaction between these networks that actually really creates the vibrancy in, in our in our view in any in any city. Ecosystem. So if you see a lot of these small and growing businesses walk onto the educational campuses, for example, and engaging with the young aspiring uh, you know, entrepreneurs who are like, ideating or who, who may even just be you know, trying to figure out if entrepreneurship is for them, you know, that interaction is very, very valuable and that forms part of what makes, makes an you know, ecosystem uh, function. And the kind of inspiration that these young people take from uh, from you know such small and growing businesses is far greater in our experience again than what they would take from you know hearing about a Narayan Murthy or a you know Flipkart or, uh, you know founder. So I think the, this this becomes a very powerful mechanism for for you know influence to happen and for people to be able to you know build those connections. So also if you start looking at the mentor network, you know, a lot of these young entrepreneurs who themselves may require mentoring can actually become very effective mentors for the, you know, for the group that comes before them. Uh, and and uh, the other thing that we've noted is that, you know, when you look at investor pool as well, there's obviously the traditional investor pool that one can, one can understand uh, and, and find everywhere. Uh, whether it's the angel seed funders or it's the early stage VC, VC funding, you know, but, uh, and, and that obviously applies to the, you know, the companies, the startups that are more ready for, uh, for such funding. And these are typically not the youngest lot, you know, that come out of campuses. Uh, so while, you know, the traditional investor pools function very well with the small and growing businesses, when you look at the younger pool of entrepreneurs, it's the small and growing businesses that are happy to put in small amounts of money into these companies. And we typically see alumni who are running their own businesses come in and put, put, you know, investing small amounts of money into the younger entrepreneurs. 
So again, I think the point I'm making is that this kind of an integration right, of groups within within a city, within an area, is really, really powerful. And so, you know, when we work with uh, uh, with any city ecosystem, our focus is to really try and figure out what exists today and you know where where are their gaps. And uh, so, if you if you see the kind of activities that we end up doing, it's everything from building the institutional uh, you know capacity so that the institutional networks can be really robust. Um, to you know, building the mentor capacity and early stage investor capacity, all of these become part of what uh, what the foundation ends up doing in order to to really you know create the vibrancy within an ecosystem. Now, I think you know um, we do that because uh, you know we're not directly a funding organization, you know, and uh, we are an ecosystem builder. So by nature, as an organization, we are an ecosystem you know, capacity organization. And I think that then puts us in a unique position to, to be doing some of these things where the benefits from what we do, you know, accrue a lot later. You know, and there are layers of things that have to happen in between before we can start to see a young entrepreneur start a company or we get jobs happen from that. So uh, that's that's really how we position if you vis a vis other organizations. Great, thank you. Um, I think, Tintin, you have much more of a uh, local focus rather than a natural focus. How, how does your work, how does your work ambition fit with the <coughs> yeah, Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chintan Bakshi. I am a Chief Operating Officer of an incubation centre called Startup Voices. Uh, this is actually a collaboration of the State Government of Rajasthan and uh, CIIE, Centre for Innovation, Incubation and Entrepreneurship at IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so as Lina mentioned, our focus is pretty much local. We are set up by the state government, so you know, obviously the focus is to kind of promote entrepreneurship across the state. But as I mentioned, we are also an incubation center. You know, so we have a physical entity. We have about twelve thousand square foot of space. We have co-workers. We have startups based in our incubation center. Uh, but the way we look at ourselves, uh, you know, being uh, based in a place like Jaipur and also you know with a larger mandate of promoting entrepreneurship in the state we look ourselves as an ecosystem player you know because that is critical for entrepreneurship to get driven you know just having a simple incubation center perhaps is good enough for a for a more evolved ecosystem like a Bangalore you know where uh, things have been happening for a lot of time and you know the ecosystem is already there it's kind of organically got developed <coughs> but in a place like Jaipur or most of the other tier 2 cities, you know, you also need or rather the incubators, I would say, need to play the role of an ecosystem player. So, need to look beyond the physical boundary of an incubation center and to kind of interface with other players which could be an NEN who is doing great work at the student level in terms of evangelizing entrepreneurship. So, we work very closely with them. We work very closely with, let's say, the local Thai chapter, which has a whole bunch of mentors. You know, these are all successful entrepreneurs. So that's the role that we play. We also are activating a local angel network. So as Sunita mentioned, you know, ecosystem needs to be a very, very local uh, sort of a thing. You know, the ecosystem has to be local. Uh, all the elements need need to be present there. Perhaps later stage funding and things, which tend to be more centralized will never happen in a Jaipur or in a tier 2 cities but the other elements maybe small grants by more successful entrepreneurs alumni of colleges these can be activated at the at the local level and just one more quick point uh, that I uh, would like to make is that uh, we also believe that and we have seen good uh, validation of this assumption is that as we start building the ecosystem in the smaller cities you know even going beyond a Jaipur to an Udaipur, Jodhpur or a beacon air, what we will also see is organically, you know, you don't need to do a lot of things to happen. You will also see a certain, a certain surge in social entrepreneurship coming up because the entrepreneurs that you get who will be more local will have a better sense of the needs of people around them, you know, in the suburb, in the semi urban or the rural areas, which is what social entrepreneurship is essentially uh, meant to cater to, you know, the BOP populations. And that's something that we have already started seeing in the last two weeks. I have met three entrepreneurs 
uh, who probably would not be able to kind of sit in front of a, or, or make a presentation in front of a angel investor, but these are really good grounded guys from the smaller cities and they got to know our startup voices, they came to us and I think they have pretty good business models, have a good sense of what the local challenges are, which is a, <clears throat> which is what a lot of social entrepreneurs also face. I, I having been uh, one social entrepreneur who kind of started in Delhi and then was trying to build a business in rural Rajasthan. So there are a lot of challenges that we as people who have been born and brought up in cities are not aware of when you start business in a local area, which is with niche networks, it's very fragmented. So I think that's that's another huge benefit of taking the ecosystem approach to, uh, you know, whether it's incubation or entrepreneurship promotion is that, you know, you really start seeing the local problems getting solved. Thank you. Um, and then we have uh, V2, who again works at the national level, but then works as an investor in agribusinesses, which of course is very rural. So how, how do you um, work with local ecosystems and how do you see them fitting in with the work you're doing? So I think I would agree with uh, the, the, what's been said. We do find that as you go further out, the local ecosystems are pretty restricted in terms of how they can support entrepreneurs. So at Echo Capital, we do work at a national level, but we do see ourselves as ecosystem players. And the, the gap that we aim to plug is at the very early stage of a company and say, you know, plug that with various different groups, uh, capital being one of them, but also looking at you know, uh, different kinds of capital perhaps that go beyond just uh, a VC style of capital because businesses need different, different, have different needs. But the more important piece I think is that we feel that between, after you've started up, probably haven't gotten some support from perhaps a local network, perhaps not a local network, and you've really struggled to sort of get to a certain point, uh, a company and an organization to sort of grow uh, needs the elements of of actually building that business out and how we could actually partner and bring value to the company to get it at a sustainable viable stage. And that's the role that we look to play in the ecosystem. That's the gap that we sort of see, uh, that it's not just a pure financing gap. There is a financing gap at the small small stage, but also that there is a there is a lot there is a gap of uh, not having enough support in that process as you're going down this journey. Um, so the local ecosystems, uh, we do see the challenges, I and mean, pretty specifically you see the challenge that you know you're very far out. You know the quality of service providers that you get it's a pretty simple thing um, is is terrible. So as a, as a result, as an entrepreneur, you spend a lot of time you know, meeting expectations that are quite different, and you have service providers that are not quite delivering those. So. Um, we try to plug those for certain things. We can't plug it for everything by using more, you know, centralized uh, uh, services that we possibly can. But uh, there, there obviously is a larger need for this to permeate and grow beyond just, you know, having having centralized systems to try to plug this. But I think as you as you grow along, we will see some of that. Please. Thank you. And then uh, we move on to more of a global perspective from Brandon. Oh, thanks. So um, when I when I think about entrepreneurial ecosystems, I think about soup. Okay, so entrepreneurial ecosystems, a fine bowl of honey. That's the image I want you to have. Think about making soup. You need lots of ingredients, right? So you need talented people. You need accelerators. You need roads. You need digital infrastructure. You need financial capital. You need government regulations. So you got all those, you throw them in the pot. But the question is not whether or not you have those assets, because most regions around the world have those assets. Now, obviously, there's a question of how good they are, and do you have enough of them? But you, you can make a soup. The question becomes, really, how well do they mix? Because it's one thing to have talented entrepreneurs, it's another thing to have uh, wealthy investors. In many, many places, they don't find each other. You have digital and physical roads to nowhere. 
So the question is not just about the ingredients, it's how they mix. And how do you get a soup to have ingredients that mix well? You have to have some kind of stock, right? The best way is to pour in vegetable stock or chicken stock. Well, in the context of an entrepreneurial ecosystem, that's the environment, and that's the entrepreneurial culture that exists in a region. And that is a key piece which is often the real downfall of most regions in the world. And that what you want to find is a stock, is a culture, where failure is accepted, and it's okay if you fail once for good reasons and try to start again, as opposed to being kicked out of the region or thought of as someone who's just a failure for life. You want to find places where meritocracy is real, so that you don't have to be from there to be successful there. It's not required that you know, your last name is on the street sign of one of the major streets in the city. Uh, where entrepreneurship is celebrated and risk taking is celebrated, where it's something which is part of what happens. So um, in creating this, you know, the, what, a more economic way of saying this is that you have assets, networks, and culture. Every region has assets. The best thing is if they have lots of them and that they are connected well, so the networks become critically important. And it's not just the formal networks. Um, in many of the places that have succeeded organically, you have really informal networks that grow. Uh, in the United States, often ironically, it's university alumni associations. So in Atlanta, for example, um, you've got the alumni associations of 20 or 30 different universities that meet on a consistent basis. And many of them become co-investors because they're meeting each other, or they're entrepreneurs who are able to find the right partners to find the accountants and the financiers that they need. Um, so the networks are key, and then ultimately it is the culture. What makes Silicon Valley so special among all other things is the culture that exists. That's what makes it so much different than other places. Not the fact that it has smart people and wealthy people. Not the fact that it has great universities. So if, if you're liking the soup analogy, then you have to ask the question, well, what's the right size pot to put these ingredients in this stuff? And the right size, as you've heard, is at the metropolitan area level. So I'm, I'm glad that we actually all agree on this. It is ridiculous to think of India as having a national entrepreneurial ecosystem. You have 1.2 billion people. And Delhi is not Goa is not Chennai, I mean it is massively different. And even at the state level, the states are too big in India to think about having a state level entrepreneurial ecosystem. You have to think about it at the metropolitan area level, the city level, where the actual interaction takes place between these ingredients. Again, the funders, the, the physical infrastructure, the research institutions that exist, the specific cultures that exist, that's where you have to make a difference. And so the, the takeaway, the implications of this is that to the degree that you're involved in policies and programs to support entrepreneurial ecosystems, you need to do it at the metro level, and you need to make sure that in some way or the other you focus on the cultural piece, which often is left out. So in that context, Andy, uh, the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, where I work, basically tries to bring together the global chefs of entrepreneurial ecosystems. So we have 220 organizations that span investors, incubators, capacity development organizations, governments, multilateral organizations, universities, consulting firms, um, foundations, anyone that sort of cares about the space uh, here in India and throughout the world. Our members literally work in every country in the world in emerging markets. So we try to bring them together so that they can learn from each other, um, so that they can share insights. Sometimes they do co-investing, sometimes they do co-funding. Um, but ultimately, we want them to work together so that they can have an impact on the regions in which they work. Great, thank you very much. Um, so my next question is, um, do you have, so we've touched on um, the issues around ecosystems in India, do you have particular examples of good practices or of, of interest of local ecosystems that are emerging or have emerged? Um, any lessons learned that you've seen from uh, what's emerging um, across India? And that's it, don't you? Yeah, I mean, uh, I can of course talk about what we have been trying to do in uh, in Jaipur. So, I mean, the ecosystem development is is being done at this, at the Jaipur level, but our mandate, of course, is to kind of maybe look at 
try and create more such ecosystems and uh, we're probably looking at or maybe we'll look at uh, you know let's say the next three or four cities in, in Rajasthan like Udaipur, Jodhpur, Bikaner uh, but right now the focus is on Jaipur so uh, I mean if I, if I talk about my experience when we started about one, one and a half years back uh, uh, so you know uh, as Andrew mentioned so all the ingredients were already there so we had a Thai uh, very fairly active Thai chapter. We had any in present there in, in some of the colleges. They had entrepreneurship cells, etc. Uh, we also had uh, in the initial stages the an, a local angel investor network already there. We also had some ecosystem events like something on a startup Saturday. Uh, you know, they were doing a few events, but it was all happening in isolation, and that's really what we did. I mean, when we started, we just basically started talking to each of these. One thing which I think is, is critical and which we had in our favor is that our team, which is very small, just three people, all three of us are entrepreneurs. So we have been entrepreneurs at various, at, uh, in, in earlier uh, avatars. And so we were able to talk very well, uh, converse well with the local entrepreneurial com committee and kind of got them uh, or, or were able to also act as a bridge between the entrepreneurs, the early stage entrepreneurs and the more senior, mature kind of entrepreneurs who can be potential investors. So we realized they were not talking to each other, you know, there was a gap. Somehow they, I mean, these guys felt that they are too early and, uh, you know, the entrepreneurs thought that they are too snooty, you know, they are like the big guys in BMWs. So, you know, these guys, uh, we are not able to talk to them. And that's what we really did. So we just got these various ecosystem players together and uh, right now we are at a stage where so when we started we, we, we probably had one entrepreneur coming to us or, or that we were incubating a month now we have about close to 40 entrepreneurs in less than one year or slightly more than one year that we have we are incubating across sectors uh, we have started doing uh, you know I'll just take one more uh, minute to give another example how the ecosystem got started. So there is this institute called Indian Institute of Crafts and Design. Rajasthan is known for crafts. So you know it, it also did not be the mobile and IT kind of uh, startups that happen. You know because it, every state or every region has its own speciality and it has its own need. And uh, you know they wanted to do some entrepreneurship development, and we we said that rather than doing an entrepreneurship course, which is what they were looking at. Let's do a series of boot camps and let's let's see what's there. I mean, it's a hypothesis that people are interested to do craft-based uh, enterprises, but let's test it out. And we did one boot camp almost uh, I think about a month back. Tremendous response. Now we are in fact planning to do a three-month accelerator program along with IICD. So IICD, Indian Institute of Crafts and Design, is can become another very critical ecosystem player uh, as far as craft-based. Enterprises are concerned. It's it's actually an incubator in itself. They have got labs where you can actually prototype, you know, various types of things. You can do block printing. You can you know do khadi and spinning and you know you can do quiz prototyping. And that's what a lab is, right? Uh, you know, a typical prototyping kind of a lab. So so I think you know coming back to the same analogy, great analogy of the soup is that while the ingredients were there. I mean, I don't think whether we changed the culture, but as an incubator, we at least got them talking to each other and, and I think to a certain extent got an element of informality in the entire process. You know, so our uh, meetings, etc. are fairly informal, you know, people coming in shorts and kind of very informal kind of interactions. So that I think created uh, the, uh, the sort of the right mixture and things have started happening. Great, interesting. Uh, Sunita, I wanted to ask, since you're working across India, have you got some examples of other interesting um, ecosystems that are emerging at a little level? Uh, uh, I, think, I think there are a lot of examples, but I want to pick up on what Randall said about culture. Um, I think, you know, we've been discovering that it's, uh, you know, that's an evolving um, whatever, you know. So. <laughs> It's an involving element, and uh, you can start with, um, you know, being in a place where uh, the first time you invite an entrepreneur to come on to a campus and speak, all he's doing is really pushing people away from entrepreneurship because all he can talk about is how difficult it is to interact with the government, you know, officials, and how much corruption he has had to deal with, and how it's really, really the bane of his life rather than, you know, the blessing. 
and, 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 and we're sitting there and we're thinking, oh my god, what did we do wrong, right? I mean, here we are to, uh, about promoting entrepreneurship and, you know, this man doesn't seem to be doing anything. So, you know, so if, if I talk of culture, you know, we realized with that first conversation between young people and that entrepreneur that we would need to sensitize even the experienced entrepreneurs as to what is the purpose of bringing them on, on to the campus. We're not asking you to come to the campus to either give your gyan or to, or to scare people away. Of course there are, you know, it's also not shying away from, from talking about the reality of the challenges. But it is really about presenting to them your experience overall in, in, in venture creation and you know if you're still at it, whether there is any value because of which you, you're still at it. Uh, so I think you know, so that's one aspect of when we talk about uh, culture in my view and it, it took a great deal of effort to continuously sensitize and we are continuously sensitizing even now. I mean I know of a whole lot of people who believe they're great mentors but they do a crappy job at mentoring. Uh, you yeah, know, and uh, I think you know that's that's a challenge that I hear all of us face. Right? So I think you know there is, there is that which which needs to happen, and that's a very important element. And over a period of time, you see that change. You see that go from you know a place where uh, you know people people were, were kind of giving direction and beyond and all of that to, to it becoming a sharing mechanism where the person who's supposed to be the expert is taking as much away from that interaction with the young entrepreneur as the entrepreneur himself and herself is taking away. So that's one thing. The second thing is just this whole thing of being an entrepreneur. I think in India, you know, there, there is still resistance to the whole idea of being an entrepreneur. <coughs> Is it as aspirational as joining McKinsey? The simple question is that. And I think that is a cultural nuance more than anything else. And how we create that acceptability and the aspirational element to being an entrepreneur is something that we need to think about carefully and we need to we need to propagate in many, many ways. And this starts, if you're talking about a young person on campus, this starts with how the faculty or the management feels about it to you know how the parent at home feels about it. And one of the things that, that we did very early was to really start the Entrepreneurship Week in India. Uh, and E Week in India is a week long, uh, it's a celebration. It's a celebration of entrepreneurship. It's a sensitization, you know, for various stakeholders. And the young kids on campuses particularly, of course there are others that participate as well. But the campuses go completely wild in, in just running a whole lot of programs around entrepreneurship. Some of the campuses in Kash shut down their regular academics, by the way, which is, you which, know, which which, campus, no? which which campus are you talking about? Uh, the, the campuses that have been engaging with uh, with the NEN network, there are about four, five hundred of them across the country, the mm -hmm. management and engineering campuses. And you do one week program like uh, that? A, a one week in February typically is the second week. February, it starts one Saturday, it ends the other Saturday, and, and, and the campuses themselves run various programs. So the student entrepreneurship clubs across the campuses are running a very wide variety of programs, everything from the summits to you know, uh, actually deploying you know, things like uh, solar technology within the, the rural areas around their campuses to doing product development and showcasing those to running panels and discussions and you know competitions and so on. Now, you know, the, the important aspect in, in E Week has always been to not just involve the regular stakeholder groups, but to involve people who are otherwise on the fringes. Bring the parents in, let them see what the kids are doing. Bring government officials in, let them experience some of this. Engage people in the community. And we've had some very interesting, you know, even short term gains from that. There was this one incident where, you know, a, a, a couple of uh, kids, twins actually, you know, uh, mm -hmm. at, at this um, institute in Mysore, very charged up about entrepreneurship, working on various ideas, you know, and about to graduate from the campus. And the parent, the father, was in a public service and was about to retire. And these kids are wanting to be entrepreneurs and he's retiring and he's having a happy time. You know, he's like, what am I supposed to do? And then he's brought onto the campus and he experiences what his kids are actually doing in entrepreneurship. And on the spur of the moment, he comes to the stage and takes the mic and he says, you know, I had no idea what my, what my children were capable of. 
what their aspirations were, what their ideas were. And, and I was resisting all of that. And I'm standing here and I'm just retiring. But I'm pledging that I will be the first funder for them. So I think, I think you know, to me that's transforming culture in, in a small way, but in a very significant way. And I think more things of course are really required and they need to be continuously required. You know, for us to be able to go out there and truly claim that we have an entrepreneurial culture across several cities in this country and not just, you know, in Bangalore. Uh, I, I think that's really what it is. We have to go from having closed door meetings about failure. That's what we're doing today. Even in Bangalore, we're having closed door meetings in, uh, you know, about failure. Why can we not talk about failure in, in forums like this? Why is this such a taboo for us? You know, which one of us has done anything successfully without failure? Great. Thank you. Um, so you talked about culture and just the, you mentioned the stakeholders and the ecosystem and how you bring them together for the entrepreneurship week. Um, which brings me on to who should be doing what if we want to create an enabling ecosystem at the local level? Who should do what? What should um, the impact investors do we do? Who, what should the incubators do? And what about the networks? So, as from the investment perspective, I, I think it's uh, it's uh, the, the local ecosystem is very, very critical, and I've been heartened to see this across a bunch of cities beyond Bangalore. Um, Jaipur was one of them. I've seen some of this happening in Calcutta. Uh, uh, we've seen, obviously, Hyderabad has, has had some of them. Uh, there's also been, you know, a bunch of work that happens at Hooghly. And uh, it, it's uh, it, it, that interaction as an investor, and something you said to them that you know the people from the local context and what they can actually bring to an entrepreneur and uh, the venture far outweighs uh, what it is you can looking at it from a you know thirty thousand feet somewhere else. So those ecosystems are fairly critical. In, in, in this process, especially in the social impact space, because they are such localized kind of uh, solutions here. So, I mean, as, as, a, as, a, as a very early stage uh, uh, investor, we would love to be able to invest in enterprises that have local investors parallelly with us, so that they can actually, you know, be of value on ground there. And we, that's really, really hard to find them. So, but as the system grows and if there's those networks, I think the whole system, the ecosystem would, would, would take a, a step. The one thing that I would add is that the, the, the local systems do need to engage with the larger systems, that it cannot all be in, in isolation of what it is, because as the company does move along and its needs change, uh, and there's a larger footprint that it's looking for, I think that exposure for the larger the larger footprint is important. I have an example of a portfolio company, and this is a cross country kind of uh, exposure, in which you know they operate out of Bangalore, so they've got enough exposure to entrepreneurs and ecosystems, and you know all the all the other things that come along with it. Sometimes as an investor, I feel too much. Uh, that there's too much of this stuff that's happening. But the entrepreneur went to Silicon Valley and came back and said, you know, oh, but I, I, you know, I always thought that we didn't have this and we didn't have this and we sort of know with all these sort of challenges and I went there and I talked to a whole bunch of entrepreneurs. We got more than that sitting right here, essentially, right? So that exposure and sort of putting himself in context of what perhaps is considered a gold standard and realizing that look what he was doing as an entrepreneur was the gold standard if not better just gave the venture just so much more uh you know confidence in what they're sort of doing so taking some of these local contexts and even in the indian context sort of putting it in connection with others is also i think a next step that's important for that ecosystem to be robust and you know grow larger larger businesses 
So I, I want to start with a, a little story that's based on a, a book by a, a great researcher named Annalie Saxinian called Regional Advantage, in which she compares the growth of Boston and Silicon Valley in the United States. So if you go back to the last millennium, 1970s or so, it wasn't clear that Silicon Valley was going to become the center of innovation, particularly around high-tech fields. Both Boston and, and the Silicon Valley area had done a lot in terms of building mainframe computers, and the question was, well, what was next? And what Saxinian suggests is that it was Silicon Valley and their willingness and their sort of vibe with things that started around Stanford and Xerox Park, Research Park, where people were used to collaborate, people were worth, used to sharing ideas where they would work generatively, as opposed to Boston, where most of the computer activity there had come from our Department of Defense. And so the culture there was about protecting information at all costs, right? We can't talk about any of these secrets to any of our competitors. And so it was this closed door idea versus the open idea. And she suggests that that cultural difference is what really made the difference in Silicon Valley taking off as a center first of microprocessors and then of personal computers and software. So I bring that up in the context of you know, who does what. If you don't have an organic scenario in which you are willing to share, in which you have open, openness to partnerships, in which critically you have trust, then what you need is some sort of connective organization, which can be an accelerator, it can be a chamber of commerce, um, it can be an entrepreneurship organization that is there trying to bring together the people so that they can start having some of those shared experiences and building at least the base level of trust that will allow them to start having informal interactions which often lead to the innovation and to the partnerships which are so critical for building entrepreneurship. So again, the takeaway that I want to share is that one way or the other, either it happens organically, which happens in very few places, particularly in my experience in emerging markets, and for that matter, in the American South. It's not what people are used to. You need people who are connectors, who are actively taking that role, who are pulling people by the ear who wouldn't normally talk to each other. So wealthy financiers and crazy professors. You know, or rural farmers and urban bankers. You need people who are playing that role. And that, over time, is how, in a generation or so, you can change the culture. And if you need those individual interactions in the context of a particular region that will have the overall impact of building that trust and changing culture. Great. Um, Jim back to Jay um, How do you, especially, you see, uh, government funded or part of government um, and you also I think um, you're also bridging both the startup the sort of conventional startup space and the social space so again how do you see what's the role of government how connected are you guys to the the, the start how connected are the social startup space and the, the commercial startup space and what should private sector do and how do you see that imagine yeah before that you know I think a uh, very interesting point uh, that you raised, Randall, about you know why the West Coast or the Silicon Valley came up and Boston did. I think it was also probably because of the counterculture, perhaps. You know, so in the in the uh, California San Francisco area, we had this entire counterculture and hippies and all that, which is generally you know looked down upon. But I think that's that would probably have been one of the key elements of people being open to sharing because you know the entire counterculture was against uh, sort of. Uh, not against capitalism, but at least the more protective kind of big uh, company capitalism. So anyway, uh, yeah, to, to kind of uh, talk about the role of governments and how we in uh, in Jaipur are kind of balancing the social versus uh, regular commercial. So I, I'll talk about the government role. So I think the role of the government is, is very, very critical uh, when we are trying to build ecosystems in the smaller cities uh, in more than one ways. Uh, in our example, the government has basically supported us and provided us the initial uh, seed capital or seed grant to do all the activities that we are doing. The second thing also is that, uh, you know, as, as, a, as an element of culture, so we are also actively working with the government to come up with a, uh, a startup policy. Uh, you know, it's going to be a policy which will basically address exactly these issues that doing entrepreneurship is not bad, 
so it's the government which is saying that you know you can be an entrepreneur and by the way if you are doing your final project as an entrepreneurial project you also get x percent grade marks and you know y percent attendance as a kind of so these are all kind of uh, measures which at, at least ensure the cultural acceptability of entrepreneurship so these are some of the things that we are working on uh, in terms of how we look at as an incubator the role that we see in terms of promoting commercial technology startups versus social it's really uh, you know i think uh, for for an incubator or an incubator like organization which is trying to play the role of the the agency or the lead agency which is building the uh, entrepreneur uh, the ecosystem through collaboration and making the culture more i don't think it really makes too much sense to kind of differentiate one with the other and the way we actually look at it is that as i mentioned earlier is that as as the uh, networks of entrepreneurship and the ecosystem you know gets more and more ingrained we think that social entrepreneurship will be an outcome you know as you have more people coming into the entrepreneurial ecosystem you will will and we have already started seeing it we will actually see a lot of people who are you know a farmer's son or someone who's you know uh, whose son has a, a retail shop in the village these are actually examples i'm saying because i have experience and met couple of these entrepreneurs who want to now build a business around it so someone who actually wants to build a business which can help people build toilets at a very low cost you know in a very scalable fashion you just order and three days it's done or someone who's trying to build a you know an, an e-commerce kind of a model using phones to a local drop point in the village uh, and that person is the son of a local uh, wholesaler so he knows the business inside out and he just needs and he's he's been an engineer and he he kind of knows how technology can be used he might not be able to develop it which is probably the role that an incubator can play in in terms of being able to give him the service providers and the platform but this person is capable enough to do it so the way we see it is that once the ecosystem is is kind of uh, you know robust in a tier 2 city social entrepreneurship and impact uh, businesses are a necessary outcome you know it will just happen and we need not necessarily choose one with the other uh, we might have to of course you know because uh, again it's a question of collaboration uh, as an incubator we will not have expertise in each and every area so we are collaborating the example i gave of the craft uh, the, you know institute so we don't know crafts but we know how to kind of do early stage mentoring iicd knows crafts so we are doing a joint accelerator so i think you know through collaboration that uh, domain expertise gap can be met thank you um, i think we're nearly at the q and a so can i have each of you take 30 seconds each um, to give your thoughts on the sort of challenges and opportunities for bringing ecosystems local ecosystems to the next level and how do we scale this effort across the country and across randall with some global thoughts and how andy looks at that across the globe Uh, so, um, so, so my observation is that you know, in in India, the effort to to build entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial ecosystems is now about a little over a decade old, about thirteen years old, and uh, you know. In the past six to seven years, we have also had a lot of players come in, which is really the good news. Uh, and much like you know any other new development, uh, each one of us focused a great deal on figuring out what we should be doing and what we can get from that. I think uh, you know, with particular reference to India, we are at a point where we need to now stop looking this so deeply inside ourselves and just focusing on that aspect. I think that's you know just something that every organization does have to do. But we really need to start looking more naturally and seeing you know what the points of collaborations are. In my view, that's both a big challenge and a big opportunity. And uh, my sense is that. You know, many of us have to consciously, uh, you know, 
ourselves. And, and I would use the word even force ourselves to try some of these collaborations. Uh, because without that, uh, you know, I think the connectivity that we're all speaking about, which is just integral to ecosystems, will not happen either at the city level or then from between city ecosystems and you know the connectivity from city ecosystems to at the national level. I think those are things that are going to be extremely hard to do if we <coughs> don't put a conscious effort. And this is not something that any one of us can do, but this is something that many of us have to do, <laughs> have to do and do it consciously. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, my, my takeaway is also very similar that it's really, and I think that's a, a view across the board that it's really a issue of building the relationships and, and collaborations, etc., which is which is the key. And, and that's where the challenge and the opportunity is, and therefore that's where the challenge is, that how do we build it? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, my other experience is that it's, 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 I think, much better to build these collaborations again at the city level. Yeah. You know, rather than trying to build it at a you know headquarter level or a head office level and hoping that things will happen at the city, you know, it really needs to be done by people who are on the ground, you know, who are doing the stuff there. Uh, so the collaborations really need to happen there. And you know, I think the other point also is that, I mean, my experience is that there there really needs to be one player. It need not be an incubator. It can even be a college. It can even be an early stage. Uh, you know, investor, which needs to take the lead, which needs to say that, you know, I I am willing to sort of try over and over again and help build the ecosystem through collaborations. And even if I fail one or a couple of times, I'll, I'll basically keep trying. So you need that bunch of passionate individuals, you know, who will try it over and over again. And, you know, and things will happen as, as the example uh, that you talked about, uh, about the, you know, the the twins who wanted to start up. So, you know, once, once people see things happening, they realize that this is what it is. You know, I think the other other quick uh, point that I would like to talk about uh, is also the fact that, you know, in India, the education system, I think, is a big, is a huge roadblock in the way of entrepreneurship. You know, it's really totally messed up, if I would use the word. You know, it doesn't help at all. It doesn't help even in doing getting a job. You know, it's, it's kind of totally out of sync with the way the, uh, you know, the the world is structured currently, completely out of sync, and definitely doesn't help in entrepreneurship. So you know, I think the the pent up demand is there. Students realize the stifling nature of the education system and want to do stuff. And once they see something happening, I think it will fall into place. So it's it's really getting the initial collaboration and the initial ecosystem together, and then it will sort of just happen organically and and scale up. So I would say that there is two things and this uh, happens at the local level as well as at the higher level that there are elements of this that are happening in the Indian ecosystem, of course we have ways to go. Uh, the two things is an enabling environment that includes culturally as well as you know educational institutions not being the roadblock but being the facilitators for people to go do this, government to have uh, you know, uh, regulatory, uh, you know, uh, have startup focus, startup friendly regulations. So there are pieces and elements of that that are happening in the ecosystem. The part of the ecosystem that uh, at least I feel is important that has happened in the Silicon Valley uh, is the fact of role models. And the role models, uh, you know, uh, being there for younger entrepreneurs. And as uh, Smita said, this is not about the role model that's far away and pretty inaccessible to you. These are role models in, within your reach and you can kind of see the steps of how you get there. I, I asked a successful entrepreneur, I said, you know, well, you built a great business, you sold it, you did very well. How come you didn't go back to build, this, build another one? Because, you know, in Silicon Valley, people are serial entrepreneurs. And he turned around to me, I spent 20 years of sweat and blood, and that's what it takes to build a business in India. I don't have the energy to go do this again. So the role models will take some time as the, as the time scale to grow these businesses decreases, but we, we need them to sort of increase for this ecosystem to really flourish. They're the ones who invest backwards. They're the ones who provide the mentoring support. They're the ones that entrepreneurs listen to because you know, you've been through that. You, you, you empathize with it. 
right? We, we, we have a board and we just, a, a, an entrepreneur, successful entrepreneur joined the board member. The rest of the board could have said whatever the hell they liked. But when this guy said it, oh yes, absolutely, right? So it's, it's such an important piece, but it's just a time thing and how we figure out how to tap into that and that system to actually turn around. Um, so I would just say, you know, each of you individually, you're something, right? You're an entrepreneur, you're a student, you're an investor, you're an incubator. Uh, you need to think about how you're building your own personal ecosystems. And if you think outside of your box and start building the connections that you need, somewhat organically, you're going to start seeing the growth of regional ecosystems. So on an individual basis, we all can do something. Get out of our box, think about who the partners are that are relevant, think about what you can do to influence the world around you that's relevant to whatever you're doing, but also might have the impact on the broader ecosystem. Um, and as for Andy, uh, we're trying to sell the recipe, right? We're trying to sell the cookbook. Um, so what we do, what I do a lot of right now is try to be in front of key um, stakeholders, particularly those with money. So you think USAID or you think the World Bank, like the Lemelson Foundation, uh, Canadians, trying to help them recognize that they need to be out of their silos. A lot of people are interested in supporting entrepreneurship right now, but they often come to it from one particular perspective. We're going to do impact investing. We're going to support accelerators. And one thing is to say, great, if you're going to do that, at a minimum, think about how your accelerator is going to depend upon the growth of the other elements of the ecosystem. Your accelerator is not going to be successful for no investors if there are no good education programs. And then even more than that, what we're really trying to promote is the development um, from a donor agency perspective, foundation perspective, of more integrated ecosystem development programs. We're built into their strategy and to their funding decisions, our efforts to say, we're only gonna do this if in fact we know that we can get this kind of collaborative activity on the ground. So we've written reports on how to do that and I'm actively advocating for that to happen here in India. Great. Um, thank you. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A, if there are any questions from the audience. Yeah. Do we need a... Yeah, you have a mic microphone. Uh, myself, I'm representing Ulvati Sula uh, so I have a question from you. Uh, what is the process of raising investment and once the investments are being raised, what is being done after? Is that more of a specific question on investment? Okay, just so I mean, are you asking from a startup's perspective? Uh, yeah, from the startup perspective. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> so, I guess, see, I mean, the way we look at it, uh, see, look at investment as an outcome. Right? It's, a, it's an outcome of having you know, a good model, it's an, it's an outcome of having a model that you have validated, right? So you, you have maybe come up with a business model or a plan and you have validated it with you know, maybe 5, 10, 15, a small bunch of customers, maybe within your college or in your locality. It's, it's also uh, an outcome of having a good financial model which is built around it because investors will invest because they see some growth in it, right? So growth of their financial capital. So once you have these three or four, and there's an operating plan, so let's say these four elements, one of, once you have these in place, uh, and you know you might need to kind of run it by a few more experienced entrepreneurs, people who have gone through the process, because they can tell you whether this is up to mark and all that. And uh, so, so we can say that at that point of time, you are ready for investment. And once you have met these three or four or five key benchmarks, and that's the time you have to go and start you know, approaching uh, people like you two and other investors and you know, uh, I mean each, each investor will have their own uh, investment theses and you know domains in which they invest or that, that they look more favorably at and stages of investment, so some will be early, some will be growth. Uh, it's, it's also possible that you might need funding just to build something. So typically investors, Indian investors and VCs will not invest at a simple idea stage, but you could even go for grants, uh, you know, from let's say the BST, Department of Science and Technology or some other uh, grant making agencies, 
if you if you need money just to build your product and to validate it. So it really depends on uh, what stage you are in. But you know, look at investments as an outcome. You know, it's not uh, something that you know. Once you have the critical elements ready, of course, there's a certain amount of effort which will be required. You know, you'll have to make a nice presentation, go and meet a whole bunch of investors, and some of them will kind of uh, get excited. But look at it as an outcome. Great. Are there? Yeah, just super briefly so others can have the so opportunity. Yeah, there's a caveat here. I think we make an assumption that every business must raise investment. And actually, that's not true. In fact, very few businesses will be the kind that should be raising you know, external investment. And so I think the fundamental thing is really how are you going to you know, grow your business and where is that money going to come from? Then that's not necessarily going to come from an investor fund, so mm -hmm. to speak. So I think that's something that we must bear in mind. Lots of very solid businesses that don't raise money from investors. Very critical point. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, can we move on? Give somebody else an opportunity? Yeah. Um. Uh, hello, I'm Dushan, and uh, I work with uh, art designs. My problem is not money, my problem is not the market. My problem is finding artisans. How does one do that? Because everywhere in the ecosystem, I find people giving me funding. I don't want funding. <laughs> I want direct linkage with true artisans who are adding artisanal value and not those people making toys. Honestly, I've been struggling for the last five years. I've been blessed by out of living, so they are helping us. But we don't find organizations in real value who are really helping us in a ground fit level. People want to give money, they're interested in building the capital. But nobody wants to really develop the ecosystem for down the rural area. How do I do that? Thanks. Um, I think the ecosystem and just talking about all, all this money and all this stuff, like the real actual value add stuff are uh, pieces we haven't talked about here. Yeah. But uh, you know, if that you're running a business, uh, you need a pretty deep help in these kind of connections, really. And uh, that those connections that all of us were here were talking about still are extremely weak. Right. And all the entities that have those deep connections are not sitting in this room. Yeah. It's, it's the problem. So it's not that they don't, right? You have to go find these entities. And I think there's a role for intermediaries to play to bring some of these these really deep experienced people. There there are people who have spent their lifetimes with artisans and can you know have put them in different levels, yeah. And sitting right here in Delhi, essentially. But they're not here, and they're not here. They 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 are sitting in their own silo, and we're not connecting that piece. Oh. If I can be a little blunt, government spends money a lot of time goes into feeding fairs all over India. Artisan and fairs doesn't get sold in India. Get sold overseas. We don't have data which are available in the books. I've approached nineties. I've approached everyone. I'm successful. We are already doing some work with fifteen hundred people this now. But we don't find how we are going to expand from between hundred to twenty five thousand. So uh, you know the every the government I, I think it will take its time or whatever it is is going to a government body it may or may not happen. Right? But in all these institutions, it could be a private uh, you know not for profit or organization or society that's been running or the government. There are individuals, and that's what makes this really difficult. There are individuals with deep experience that you just cannot replicate, but are invaluable to people looking for artisans. So if you go to the wrong person in this part department, it unfortunately doesn't work, right? It, it, it's not only true for artisans, it's true for agriculture, it's true for a, a whole bunch of these things, right? So it's that you have to find that one gem of a person and that's exactly what makes this Deep experience and collaborating with deep experience is difficult. Great, thank you. I think we had. Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry, no. I mean, yeah, I, I just thought of doing some marketing there. I mean, you can come to our accelerator, the craft accelerator that we are doing with the ISCD. It starts in June or July. So just be in touch and maybe we can help you there. Great, so we have two more questions, three more questions. So, super brief questions and brief answers. First at the back, and then we have you, and then we have you. So, if you um, start. Hi, this is Vikram with the Bio Social Ventures. Um, I have a really good question. I think we spoke about a lot of the initiatives that are happening within the ecosystem. So, 
the incubators are there, the social enterprises are there, the investors are there. Um, whose responsibility is it to sort of coordinate the ecosystem? Um, B, is that necessary? Do we need to coordinate the ecosystem? Um, and see what's, what's happening about it. What are your views on really just, you know, as an entrepreneur, for example, the shirt in front, if he wants to do something, he doesn't know where to go because there are 30 different incubators out there he could approach. So who's coordinating this to make sure it's not getting cluttered in one aspect of this chain and you're sort of spreading that out and figuring out where people should be focusing. And so is that happening? Who should be doing that? And is that necessary? I think the short answer is not really happening. But <laughs> well, I would use the term facilitate, not coordinate. It's impossible to coordinate an entire ecosystem. But again, I would go back to the point, which it is helpful to know of at least one. And in an ideal world, there might only be one. That won't happen. But at least one organization that can make the connections. So again, it can be an accelerator. It can be the regional chamber of commerce, if that's what you have. It can be lots of different. It can be a university, if they have the right linkages. You do want to have that organization that knows where the investors, the accountants, the artisanal uh, technical systems are. Um, but don't assume and don't even seek to have an organization that actually coordinates the activity for that regard. Any more thoughts? Yep. Yeah. Uh, sorry, no, it's, it, it's the guy behind you, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, I'm Akshay. I'm a student from the Yadinia Fellowship. Uh, I wanted to ask that uh, incubation generally, it takes a lot of time to uh, realize. Uh, so, you work with the startups, and uh, till they are, they, they are out there, it takes time. So, in that gestation period, the support that you give them, how do you uh, how do you recognize whether it's being effective or not in the gestation period where they are developing? <laughs> so I guess uh, uh, you know. So in other words, the model that we follow uh, as an incubation model, which which is uh, something that a lot of other incubators have also started following, is more of an acceleration model. So you know, there's a there's typically a start date and an end date. It's not that hard and fast the way we do it. Uh, uh, so you know, we when we sit with an entrepreneur, then we start. So we we kind of make a roadmap that okay, over the next three months, you know, this is the kind of support we think you need, and this is the more likely outcome after the end of the three month period. And we typically have a once in uh, once a fortnight review, which is either done on a call or uh, typically done on a call and once a month physical meeting where we actually call all our incubators together for a day and half day is uh, more formal and the other half is fun. So that's how we kind of uh, make sure that there is a start date and end date and you know there is uh, progress monitoring which is happening which is good both for the incubator as well as the entrepreneur. So everyone knows where the other person is going and it's, it's not just a unending kind of a support of work. I'm afraid I only have one question left, so it's this one here. Um, could you take it could you take it outside? To build the business to build the startup it takes like a year or probably more than a year to build the business. So how do you like deal with our support is even for very early stage entrepreneurs. You know it's not that you need to Come to us with a with a running business, and then we help you. Can even be you know someone coming to us with an idea, and uh, you know, we we basically engage with very early stage entrepreneurs. All right, thank you. Uh, so super short. You have ten seconds. <laughs> And uh, Muratabad, uh, which is great architecture jewelry. And I've studied in Jandigarh, which is near Singrul. And you have a lot of agricultural innovations taking place in Singrul. It's a hub open down the uh, agriculture market. So, what do you think uh, promoting this kind of uh, startup ecosystem for social entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in general? Entire three cities. I understand for Tire 2 and Tire 1, which is pretty, pretty straightforward coming. But Tire 3 is more difficult, nobody speaks English over there. What do you think about it? I'll give an answer you're not going to like. It's still the same work. It's just harder. 
an ecosystem is an ecosystem wherever you are, and the same elements, the same ingredients, the same need for full certain stock, it's just work. Uh, and this is the, the opportunity is to try to bring in people from other communities to find the, the folks that have been successful and really celebrate them. The good news is it's smaller, so it's going to be easier to connect. At least you don't have a problem of being too big, um, but it's the same challenge wherever you are. I, I agree completely. But I also think that you know one other thing that we should be thinking about, particularly you know people like you, is, is that the, you know, if, if we expect that some central players are going to come in to into care free cities or poor cities and do something you know extraordinary, I think that's not going to necessarily you know happen uh, for the simple reason that those players are probably just you know, have only that much bandwidth and resource to do work in, you know, the four cities that they might be focusing on. So I think that's not going to happen, but if we understand that there are some ingredients, like Francis said, to building an ecosystem, I think local people, people who care, people like you need to, you know, get started in some place. You, you know, what is it that you can do and are there four other people who, who, who are like you that you can bring together? And, and those may be small ways to actually get those get those ecosystems going. When there's some traction, you'll see a lot more people from Tier 2 City come in and then, you know, start engaging and interacting and all of that. But, but at that level, I think that's what we want. See, one, one thing that you can try to do in a, in a small city which doesn't have anything is to you know, start with small events. So you don't need to, you don't need a physical incubator or anything, uh, not necessarily need a physical incubator in a small city. Just to a startup weekend or a hackathon or one of these events. And you know, see what what happens. You know, lean, you know, the the lean startup method. So start with a one day hackathon or a two day hackathon. Get people and you know, let's uh, you know like a typical hackathon methodology. You just create groups and they work around issues. Let's say about agriculture implements etc. And you know, start creating that culture of people working in groups, co-creating. So it might be tough doing it. You know, in order to in order to get people to do it, but you know, you can tie up with a college or something like that and start with an event rather than thinking big. Start with something small which you can quickly do in a day or two days. Uh, so, uh, I just want to give a quick example of something that we tried which actually had really good results. Uh, so, we now function, we are also operating in uh, Saudi Arabia and Wadi Khan, in Victoria, Pakistan. And one of the things that we noticed is that uh, there isn't that much entrepreneurial activity there as we have in India. And there's a great deal of interest, uh, you know, amongst the local people there for what's happening here. And so, you know, we said, okay, you know, technology is actually very powerful these days, right? And we tried video conferencing between the city there and, you know, people here. And frankly, that, that created a huge amount of energy and, and you know, potential opportunities for further interactions and all of that. And that one thing was just enough and, you know, the first realization was, which is a very, very strange thing for me, but the first realization was, oh, we're very similar people. So it didn't matter that we, that we spoke slightly differently or had different cultural nuances or, or even the fact that we're India and Pakistan and that there are some, you know, barriers there. But the fact that the realization that once people start talking and language doesn't matter really, you know, if, if there is a way for people to talk in Hindi there and talk in Hindi here and, and for them to understand each other, I think that just breaks the barriers between and the possibilities of what you think of Hindi to become very, very, very strong. So actually, I think the entrepreneurial activity in Tier 3, Tier 4 city is very high in India. Right? And it's actually broken in the ones and twos. So if you go down to these places, I mean, maybe we're not talking about the, you know, whatever, in a fancy forum of what it is. But, but, but the support systems, the connections, the way that the entrepreneur works at that, sit, at, at that local level is very, very high. Whereas if you go to a depot, it's way deeper. It's way deeper. So uh, I, I'm not sure that there is an ecosystem to fix there. The only difference is that that ecosystem works in its own way, right? And it's got, you know, I know so-and-so who actually gives out cash and will support my business and this is a little slip I will write and this is how I think that I can do.